Well, thank you everybody for joining us. This is our um, first webinar for Data Science in the News for 2024. I'm Perry Mangerson. I'm Distinguished Professor of Statistics at QUT and this, the Director of the Centre for Data Science. The Centre for Data Science has been hosting these uh, webinars uh, for the last close to four years. And uh, they've been really aimed at bringing expert uh, discussion around topics that are pressing our society and our news um, and of interest to the general public. Um, and with a focus on data and data science. So what has data and data science got to do with these kinds of issues? I'm going to start the session by turning to our centre manager, Becky Cook, to, um, to give an acknowledgement to country. Thank you, Kerry. Ngari um, Urengi Ari Wanjai, I greet you all today. Um, my name is Becky, I'm Nunakal Aboriginal woman. I'd like to pay my respects to the Turrbal and the Yagara as the traditional custodians of the land where QUT now stands. I'd like to acknowledge their elders, their laws, their customs and creation spirits, and acknowledge that the lands where QUT are have always been places of teaching, learning and research. I'd also like to acknowledge the custodians of country from where everyone is joining us from today. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Becky. And so, our, as I said, our Centre for Data Science has been hosting these webinars for close on four years. And um, this first data science in the news webinar for 2024 focuses on an issue that's one of the most pressing social issues facing Australia, homelessness. So homelessness has become a significant concern and touches all of us. So a rising number of individuals and families experiencing housing insecurity across the country. There are many, many factors that are affecting and, uh, and causing homelessness at the moment and, and this growth of the, this issue. Um, what we also know uh, with our other hand is that data and data science really play a key role in learning more and more deeply than ever before about the world around us, our economy, our society, our own selves. But the question is, what role does data and, and insights about from data play in major issues like homelessness? So how do we characterise homelessness today? And how does data and data science really play a role in that particular issue? So to discuss this, we've brought together a wonderful team of experts for this webinar. And our team comprises uh, four panel members, Firstly, we have Natalie Garth, Data Systems Lead for MICA Projects and Co-Data Lead for Brisbane Zero and National Data Lead for AAEH. Um, also, Natalie's a QUT alumni from 2014. So welcome, Natalie. And um, the second panel member is Professor Melissa Bull. Look, um, Melissa is the Director of the QUT Centre for Justice here. And our third panel member is Dr. Deborah Akin Lurton. She's a, a postdoctoral um, research fellow at the QT Centre for Data Science and also involved in the Securing Antarctic's, Antarctica's Environmental Future. Our fourth panel member is Associate Professor Gentry White, who's an Associate Professor in Data Science and the Government Statistics Chair. So welcome to our panel members. Um, I'll just very give you a Brief look, one minute to talk a little bit about yourself, um, and and then we'll start with the the, um, the discussions. So, Natalie, just over to you. Tell us a little bit about you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, so, I'm Natalie. My name uh, my name is Natalie. Sorry. So, my role as the data lead is to support the work that we do in Brisbane through the Brisbane Zero campaign. So how we collect our data, how we then use that data for systemic advocacy and to support people experiencing homelessness directly. Um, and also supporting communities within Queensland and across Australia with similar zero campaigns. So how do we actually firstly bring our stakeholders together, put the systems in place to make sure that we're collecting the right data using similar tools and how do we then use that to again, inform our advocacy and change locally and across the country. Perfect, thank you. Melissa. Hi, I'm Melissa Bull. As uh, um, Kerry said, I'm the uh, director of QUT Centre for Justice. 
But in relation to my own research, this is a really important topic because my own research is interdisciplinary research focused on social uh, inclusion and uh, community capacity building, particularly from um, uh, in relation to diverse groups. And homelessness, as we know, touches people across those sectors uh, and is particularly prevalent in those who are marginalised, perhaps left out of the economy or uh, not included in society in particular types of ways. Thanks, Melissa. Over to you, Deborah. Yeah, thank you very much, Karen. My name is Deborah, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at QUT, um, Centre for Data Science School of, and the School of Mathematical Sciences. Um, I'm working on an Antarctica project that is funded by the ARC Special Research Initiative, which is the Securing Antarctica's Environmental Future. And um, I'm a decision scientist and applied mathematician and applied ecologist. Thank you. Thank you. And Gentry. Yeah, so I'm I'm Jeffrey White. I'm the uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics Associate Professor of Data Science and co-chair of Government Statistics at the Center for Data Science. Um, I'm also the domain leader for Government Systems in the Center for Data Science, uh, and I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Mathematical Sciences at QUT. Um, I've done some. Uh, I I know Melissa from years ago um, at CEPS over at Griffith. Um, and I was also involved in the Institute for Social Science Research at UQ several years ago. Did a fair amount of work in the social sciences, um, including uh, issues around homelessness. Um, and particularly, I think it was homelessness in some vulnerable communities, such as older Australians. So um, I think this is, like I said, I'm very interested in how data gets from the raw data collected to being a usable product that can actually uh, inspire and drive change. Okay, thanks very much, Gentry. That's great. Okay, so the way that we're going to uh, to run the webinar is that I'm going to turn over to each of the uh, turn to each of the panel members and uh, to ask them to spend about five minutes telling us about uh, from their perspective, uh, you know, the the, the um, talk about this issue and uh, and to talk about the role of um, of data and data science in homelessness. So um, I'm going to start first with Deborah. Um, Deborah, I'm going to turn over to you. Thanks, Kerry. I'm just going to share my slide very quickly. Um, so I just said I'll talk about a few facts that I've read on the internet about homelessness. Um, it's not really my key area, but um, I gathered a few facts online. And uh, um, I realized that homelessness is actually not um, really an underdeveloped country problem because one would think that um, because one is in a developed country or developing countries that they would be um, exempt from this kind of problem. But then I realized it's it's a worldwide phenomenon happening in developed countries, underdeveloped nations and developing nations. Um, another thing I realized is that housing is a primary component of the social determinant of health. Thus, homelessness can be classified as a serious public health issue. Um, there are also a myriad of um, causes of homelessness, which can include poverty, alcoholism, substance abuse, um, inadequate facilities and care for people with mental illnesses, family breakdowns, relocation, and, and all those kind of things. And um, another fact is that the inadequate use or sharing of data on homelessness contributes largely to the lack of sustainable solutions. I mean, we do not, we're not um, oblivious of the fact that this is a problem, but then why is this problem persisting? So I saw that there is a lack of um, integration or sharing of data across um, different agencies which is contributing to this. And it is very important to know that early intervention and prevention is key to solving the problem of homelessness. Um, I've just got a few statistics here, which I'm, I'm confident that Gentry is still going to touch on. But um, from what I got from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, um, more than 122,000 people were estimated to be homeless in um, 2021, the last census. And um, a lot of them are young people. So about 23% of them are aged between 12 to 24. That's quite um, a high number for young people that are homeless. And um, a lot of these people are categorized to be homeless based on whether they are squatting in several places or they're living in crowded dwellings or they're living in supported accommodation for the homeless and the likes. 
But as I've said before, it is important to know that a lot of these people are very young people, mainly between um, 19 and 24, and also quite a lot of them um, from the ages of 25 to 234, um, which covers a group that I'm also very interested in, which is students. Um, I'm the coordinator for the um, HDR Academy, HDR BLI degree research students. So I kind of have an access to the kind of challenges that even students as young people are facing when it comes to homelessness or, or housing crisis. Um, so I have, there are a few critical questions that we need to ask ourselves before we can address these things. So like I said, we're not oblivious of the fact that this is a problem in Australia and in many other countries of the world. But the question is, are governments, um, relevant agencies and non-governmental organizations, are they actually expending their money and resources with a long-term vision or they're just focusing on plans to make it through another day, another tenure or just another term? Are we, do we really want to solve this problem? Are we optimizing the resources we have? Another question is, are they effectively utilizing existing data and technologies? I know we do all these sensors, we collect all this data, you know, Centrelink is going to have the data, the census guys are going to have the data, probably the medical practitioners, we have some of the data. But how are we using all of this data and the available technologies to have a comprehensive view that will enable them to go, you know, get ahead of the problem? So I think um, strategic data collection and useful um, use of this data is very pivotal to solving the issue of homelessness. I believe it is essential that different relevant or germane systems of government, NGOs, and agencies, they need to securely and strategically exchange and integrate all of this numerous multivariate data that we have in all of these different sectors on the subject for comprehensive data analysis. Um, because this will assist in the identification of the specific factors that predisposes an individual or a family or a community to homelessness um, so that this can be addressed with comprehensive, personalized health and social services before homelessness are actually happen. Um, so how can data help? Um, I think, like I said, there are already a lot of technologies that can be used that are being used in many other fields that we can bring into to solve this kind of problem. So there are lots of data science methods that we can use to build tools on um, data integrated from all of these different agencies and uh, which can help governments to optimize and distribute limited resources to areas of people that are predisposed to homelessness in a system-wide, um, some holistic um, approach to solving this problem. Because I don't think it's just one arm of the government that can um, um, help to solve this. I also think um, there are different types of models that can be used to identify individuals, regions, groups, families, communities that predisposed to these homelessness and the factors that makes them to be more predisposed to them and that can even predict how soon they are predisposed to them. So we're not um, trying to solve the problem of someone who may be homeless in 10 years as compared to someone who is already very close to becoming homeless. Um, I acknowledge the fact that there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution to this, but data analytic tools can be used to prepare feasible solutions to prevent and address existing homelessness in a personalized care framework that would involve all the relevant agencies via connected human services. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Deborah. That was um, that was excellent. Um, I really like the the proactive and predictive um, uh, proposals that you're putting forward. Um, that's uh, that was excellent, and thank you very much for setting the scene. So so well with um, with some of the, the where we're at at the moment and what the statistics are. So it was very, very helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn now to um, to Melissa. And Melissa, would you like to talk to us, please? Over to you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, Deborah, that was great and really did set us up well. But I guess I want to take a slightly different tack. Um, so when we're thinking about homelessness and you know, what role can data play, we need to ask the question of, well, how is homelessness defined and what is it that we're talking about? And when most people think about homelessness, they think about what's visible. So they think about people who are sleeping rough or they think about people who end up in specialist housing services. Actually, it's much uh, uh, wider than that. And I think the recent crisis in Australia has started to alert us 
to that. We're starting to see people living in tents in cities where we never saw it before. Uh, near where I live, there are people who have cars, live in tents, catch the train to work every day and they're homeless. So it's, it is a question of what counts as homelessness and how do we capture it? And you started to talk about some statistics and you were talking about young people, but one of the areas that's been the fastest growing over the last couple of years has been homelessness amongst older people, older men and older women. And there's a gender dimension to this. In particular, the group that's uh, growing sort of more than anything else is older women. And one of the challenges here, particularly in relation to data, is that this group is often invisible. And so we need to ask the question, why are they invisible? A lot of the cancer census, those types of things, rely on you know, capturing people who are sleeping rough or in specialist housing services. If we take women as an, these older women as an example, they don't see these places as safe places, so they don't go there, they don't use those services. Um, and often they don't even perceive that they're homeless or experiencing housing stress that is close to the tipping point. Um, these women uh, often have le lived very typical lives and it's a, you know, a, a convergence of life circumstances that uh, puts them to a tipping point. It might be ill health, the end of a relationship, it could be domestic violence um, and family violence, uh, it could be the loss of job um, or the breakdown of relationship. And they're in this precarious situation because if you think about the structural factors that contribute uh, to women's social position, um, you know, they've been rearing families, they don't have the same types of employment history, they often don't have an adequate uh, tenancy history. If they've been in a relationship that breaks down, I mean, I've heard... Uh, of cases where you know they've done the right thing with their super, combined it with their partner, the relationship's ended. They don't have enough resources to actually uh, get them out of that situation. So they solve problems in their own ways. You know, they stay with family, they couch surf, uh, they uh, house sit, they do a bunch of other things. But this means that this group is not captured in statistics. It's not captured in census and so I mean and these aren't uh, I know there are similar examples with young people as well uh, where they find alternative ways but that's a real problem in terms of actually knowing what uh, you know the the scope of what we're dealing with and the sorts of things that can contribute the other thing that I think is challenging in how we respond is um, uh, well, it's actually how we respond. So the tendency uh, is to come in at the crisis point. And uh, again, Deborah, I really like to point on prevention because I think it's it's the key, but it's something that we over overlook. So at the moment, most of uh, the investment in responding um, to people who are experiencing housing stress or are homeless uh, is at the crisis end of the spectrum. Um, but and this actually costs a lot more money than if we responded earlier. I mean, there, it's billions of dollars. Um, I had some nice figures somewhere. Uh, uh, I, I, I've sort of moved on a bit, so I won't bother. I'll come back to them a bit later. But I think uh, one of the challenges is how can we use data to understand where those tipping points are uh, and help to provide support services at an early point in time. So this would be adopting other health-based models. We've seen it in relation to um, cancer prevention, breast cancer prevention, in relation to uh, seat belts, in relation to other things. One of the unfortunate things there is it's hard to measure success. And so, you know, uh, governments like evidence-based policy making and if you can't capture the evidence, it's very hard to, um, to make a case for investing at a much earlier point in time. So I think they're the challenges. I have some ideas about prevention um, that we might come back to a bit later.
Okay, thanks very thanks very much, Melissa. That's um that's very interesting, and I really like the um the 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 challenge that uh, that you posed there about you know if we prevent something, how do we measure that we've prevented it, and therefore you know how does it actually come into our evidence base? Um, to to talk a little bit more about that and about the the data gathering, that Natalie, would you like to tell us about um the uh, what you do and how and how you contribute to this? Yes, I can. I'll just share my screen. All right, so I'm going to take a slightly different take on all of the great conversations that have been happening so far. Um, so again, just a little bit about me. I've thrown up here a website, brisbanezero.org.au. Write it down, check it out. That is where you can get back to some of the data that we are collecting at the moment in Brisbane. Um, so just a quick background on what Brisbane Zero is. It's a follow-up on work that's already been done. We've been collecting data on homelessness in Brisbane since about 2010. We've done it through two previous campaigns, 50 Lives Campaign and 500 Lives Campaigns, and we outdid the target by working collectively across the sector. Outdid the target, meaning we did 230 in our 50 Lives, 50 Homes, and 580 housing placements in our 500 Lives, 500 Homes campaigns. And that is what has been the driver for us to move into what is now called Brisbane Zero. So Brisbane Zero is the ongoing commitment to being to working together as a community across different sectors in this in homelessness. So it's health, it's settling, it's housing, to try to house as many people as we can and bring the number of people experiencing homelessness as close to zero as possible. Um, the idea is that we're going to keep trying to bring it down and try to then influence the system to actually change to the point where somebody experiencing homelessness will do so for a rare occasion, a brief occasion, and hopefully will never happen again. Cool. Now, the way that this all worked is what we've been doing is using the data. We've used a common tool, we've used a common database, and that has meant a shared data set. And that is where we've started to see the success of the work that we're doing through these zero campaigns. And that's, fall, and that's how we then measure what we're doing. So with Brisbane Zero, what we measure is how many people coming into the homelessness system, how many people actively homeless, and where they actually flow out to. Okay, so with our homeless with our campaigns at Advance to Zero, this is something that's been happening not only in Brisbane, but across at least 15 other cities across Australia now, and it's growing. We have another 14 cities across Australia that are trying to launch zero campaigns. We use this data that we collect to know who people are, to know how they interact with the different systems, to know what they need, and then to measure our outcomes. So when we look at who people are, we know who exactly is experiencing homelessness in Brisbane at any given point in time while they're engaging with any of our services that are also participating in the campaign. We have over 18 partners across Brisbane that are participating in this campaign, and that helps to actually be able to quantify how many people we're working with. The data that people that services collect, often we might say that one service might be working with 100 people, another service is working with 100 people, but without being able to share that data, we don't realize how many people are actually touching base with more than one service at any given time. And people will touch base with multiple services. They're resourceful, they want help, they will go to a number of services that are looking for it. The data set and the database that we use is shared. So if someone goes from one service to another, that information and history that they have, their journey that is in the system will follow them and they don't have to repeat themselves. We then can also use that to look at our systemic interactions. So where people are touching base with health, with domestic violence, with hospitals, with other temporary accommodation providers, emergency service providers, we can then start to map out how we need, where the areas are that we could have actually tried to intervene in somebody's homelessness and try to start changing the way the system works there. Knowing what they need helps us to understand what services are available or are not available. And being able to measure our outcomes helps us to be able to see, are we making a difference with the way the collaboration works? Are we actually reducing the number of people experiencing homelessness? And are we getting more housing outcomes because of it? And I do have a great example of one initiative using our data that if I've got time, I hope I'm not going too fast. I feel like I've had a lot to throw into a small time frame. This is very difficult to condense. So one of our greatest achievements so far is our Brisbane 045 plus First Nations strategy. Using the data that we have been collecting in Brisbane on our by name list, we worked out that 
although the number of people who do identify as First Nations in Brisbane is between two to 4%. They actually make up close to 25%, sometimes 26% of our active homeless by name list in Brisbane. When we went through that actual list, we started filtering down how old are they, how frequently are they presenting to service, and we worked out that we actually have a top 10 list of people who have been on our by name list the longest. Half of them identify as First Nations. When we further broke that down, we looked at, well, of those people, how old are they? And they were over the age of 45 and didn't quite qualify for senior housing because they were still under the age of 50. So we started what is called the 45 plus First Nations housing strategy. And with that strategy, we kicked it off last year, February. And since then, we have housed 100 First Nations rough sleeping, formerly rough sleeping individuals in Brisbane through our collaborative efforts. So knowing who we're working with, being able to break it down to what do they need? How are they interacting with the systems? helps us to then actually look at what service sec what the service sector is missing and how we can then get people housed and try to keep them housed. Some of this data has also been used to try to gather some more funding around this tenancy sustainment space. So collectively, we've collected enough data for a First Nations support agency to then go forward to the department and apply for funding to then start rolling out tenancy sustainment for First Nations peoples who get housed. So knowing who we're working with, knowing what we're doing and being able to actually measure that can make a massive difference. And we're seeing that not only across Australia, we've seen that across the US, we've seen that across Canada. It's also launched in Finland, France and the UK. We know this idea can work. We know this data can work. And we just need to make sure that we are harnessing that data to make better outcomes happen. I feel like I went really fast with that. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, that was fantastic, Natalie. What a what a fantastic effort! Uh, it's um it's uh, really inspiring to listen to to what you're doing and um and the outcomes that and the impact that you're having. So thank you. Okay, so if you can stop sharing now, um, then we'll move to our final panel member and Gentry. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Um... Well, that's some very interesting talks, and uh, m many of you stole my bit. Um, but no, I, I think it's actually, we've seen three different perspectives so far. Um, and we've seen three sort of crucial pieces of the puzzle, I think. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the ABS data, the ABS data methodology, and what we can learn from that. But I think it's important to point out that, you know, Deborah sort of emphasized having the right tools for analysis, which is is turning that raw data we've collected into information that we can use to guide action. Okay, as one piece of the puzzle, Melissa was, was very good about pointing out that we need to understand the nuance of the problem because it's not just a problem of numbers, and and we need to make sure we dig deep into that data and understand things, like the problem with women and homelessness oftentimes are very different uh, causes and very different situations than men in homelessness. Older women especially are especially vulnerable, I know. Um, and then finally, I think Natalie pointed out, the thing that Natalie pointed out that was really important was the power that you get when you get everybody using the same data and everyone has the same facts and they're working together and they're sharing information, that's when you can get really powerful change. Um, and and really see things happen when you can get people talking to one another um, over a common and agreed set of facts and reality. Um, but yeah, so I, I'll talk a little bit about the ABS data and, and kind of drill down on that. And I thought, and and I'm going to go ahead and share some some web pages here if I can. So the ABS does collect data. And Melissa was pointing out that like oh, it's it's very hard to cap capture, um, et cetera. And I'm going to talk about the methodology, but what was interesting is, and I found this kind of uh, an interesting thing to note, and Deborah pointed this out. On census night 2021, ABS counted 122,494 people experiencing homelessness. Uh, right away, we can look at that and say the problem with census data in Australia is that it, it counts people who are at home on one night during uh, every 10 years or, or, or 
it's not every 10, I think it's five, isn't it? Um, and so that can kind of be problematic, especially for homelessness, uh, because that can be a very, it can be a transitive state. Um, what was interesting is then I went over to, I went over to Homelessness Australia on their fact sheet. And it says down here, where is it? Right, here we go. This says on any given night, 122,494 people in Australia are experiencing homelessness. That's a slightly different interpretation of what the ABS data means. Um, so I think that's a, a little, I, I thought that, well, that's kind of interesting. How are they using this data? Um, but back to the ABS data, I think is, um, you know, they broke down some basic facts. It's majority male versus female. 23% of the people experiencing homelessness are between 12 and 24. Um, we can certainly see that homelessness is an increasing trend. Um, I think anyone who, who lives or works in the city can tell you that uh, just based on, on living in the city and what we've been seeing the past few years. But what was really interesting, I thought, was that they broke down homelessness. And I wanted to get to this graph right here, graph three. Counts of people experiencing homelessness by age and operational group. Now, by operational group, they mean different defini definitions of what homelessness means. And the ABS definition is careful to not confuse uh, homelessness with uh, necessarily rooflessness, as they say. Um, it's not just people sleeping rough. It's people who are living in supported accommodation, people who are staying temporarily with other people. They include people living in boarding houses or other temporary lodgings, and they also include a category called crowded dwellings. And that one I thought was particularly interesting um, as it really did apply to young people quite a bit. Um, and if you look overall at the counts, they say 12 to 24. I would say really it's this 19 to really even... 30, early 30s group that to me looks like the biggest group of people experiencing homelessness. Um, I'm not sure the numbers they've looked at, but to me, that's the biggest one. And we really see the problems are, if we go and you can highlight these things, you can see the number of people living in improvised dwellings, tents, or sleeping out is actually quite small, but it's actually probably the most visible image of homelessness that we have in our sort of popular perception. Really what we're looking at is you're looking at people living in overcrowded conditions um, or, you know, boarding houses or living temporarily or in some kind of supported accommodations. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting. Um, we also see this, you know, there's this decline in the counts for older people, which I think is interesting and I'm not 100% sure if they're capturing all the all the data they need to there. But it's nice, they have some nice breakdowns of some numbers here. Deborah was smart and she got the per capita numbers down here, which was good. But what was also interesting that I wanted to talk about was where they talk about how they define homelessness and how the ABS defines homelessness. And this I think is, is in many ways, it's the key problem. How we define homelessness and what we're conceptualizing as homelessness. And this is sort of their statistical definition that they have derived. And they've got, you can read the methodology, the information papers on how they derived this, if you like. Um, but it was in consultation with many, many experts in the area. So they're looking at living in inadequate dwellings. Uh, they have no tenure, or if their initial tenure is short and not extendable, i.e. they're living in temporary housing, they're not permanently, they don't have a permanent place left. And I thought this was interesting. It does not allow them to have control of and access to space for social relations, which I think is a really important distinction. That, uh, and, and it captures that dimension of what it means to have a home. Um, and, and it's a much more um, powerful kind of criteria or definition of homelessness. But I think it's lost if we just think about it in terms of people who don't have a place to stay. Um, so yeah, so it's around sort of the, uh, these these sort of criteria. Um, they get into this and they've they've collected the data, the 
homeless enumeration data as they've done. I won't go into great number of details, but if you read through this and you look at what they've done, they've done a great deal of work attempting to really reach out and count those homeless populations. And not just in terms of, of counting people sleeping rough or who are in um, temporary accommodation, but they've, they've, they've gone a long way to try and capture a lot of those things. I don't know how well, I think, you know, as we pointed out, oftentimes, um, you know, they talk about one of the causes of homelessness for women is fleeing domestic violence. And oftentimes they do not want to avail themselves of public services simply because they are not safe. Um, and so the questions are, how, how are we going to capture that group? How do we capture that data? I think it's an important question that we ask. But um, all of this, I think, is very interesting. I think it's been a very interesting discussion. And I think we've really sort of hit on a number of issues in terms of thinking about how data can help this issue or any other kind of issue, which is, you know, what are the tools to convert that data into actual intelligence? Are we being smart about how we're collecting the data? Are we collecting the right data? And are we sharing it with people who can help? And so I think those are things. And, and Melissa did point out the, um, what I think in, in epidemiology, they call the prophylactic effect, which is when you do preventative care, you have a hard time proving that it worked. And for those of us older, old enough to remember the Y2K bug, we all remember how everybody thought the Y2K bug was, you know, this horrible flaw in computer code that was going to crash civilization if you know it, and then nothing happened and everyone said it was a hoax. Well, part of what happened was a lot of people fixed a lot of computer code beforehand, but it's difficult to prove that. And even in, in sort of medical epidemic, uh, medical um, or disease epidemics, it's hard to prove those kinds of things, you know. I think in Australia, there's probably a lot of people saying, well, why did I have to go to lockdown? Why did I have to get a vaccine? We never had a problem here. So, and I think that's that's one of those things about preventing homelessness. You ask people to make an investment to prevent any kind of social ill like that. And um, if they don't see a result, they don't think, they don't value the effort sometimes. Anyway, so that's my contribution. Well, thank you very much, Gentry. That's really helpful, and it's very helpful to point to the Bureau of Statistics and the, the efforts that they go to to uh, to try to address or to try to collect the appropriate data for homelessness. I'm going to come to that question um, now, and we'll just have some, um, some Q and A now. If if any of the people online would like to ask a question, please put it in the chat. I see that there's one question there, and we'll come to that in a minute, but. Gentry, you pointed to the, the issue of collecting, like the difficulties of collecting data about homelessness. Natalie, would you like to comment a little bit on that? And then I'm going to just turn to Melissa and ask about that too. Absolutely. And we were actually quite involved with the last census um, across Australia in communities that do have by name lists operating and uh, was something that we'd actually been speaking to the ABS for in, for months leading up to it to try to really help them out with how they're going to capture that data. Um, it even came down to who they used to go out and speak to people where we advocated that it should be people who work with the homeless population directly who should be going out to actually look for people and not just general volunteers. Um, so with our data collection, we do, and that that is the biggest thing is how do we know that we're collecting enough data or we're getting the right data and we grapple with that constantly because it does depend on who presents to a service a lot of the times even with AIHW data it's presentations so you have to have gone to a specialist homelessness service to then be counted in that data with AIHW what they collect um, but that's why we try to make sure that we are touching base with multiple service sectors. So we've got mental health and we've got hospitals on board and we come to our collaboration and we can come and sit down at the table together to talk about who are we seeing quite frequently, how many people are we seeing and what's going on currently in the ecosystem that is Brisbane and even include some legal services um, that we do work with here as well who do come to the table too. So it is really difficult to capture the right data and to know that we're actually capturing everything, but we do believe we're making a really good 
really great progress, being able to capture at least as close to real time data as we can. And that was that's the other issue with census data is the data is old by the time it gets to us, it's outdated. So with the zero campaigns, what we're trying to do is make sure we've got monthly data that gives us a much better picture of what's actually happening on the ground and who are we really working with right now. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's excellent. Melissa, would you like to touch on that as well? Uh, yeah, I just, um, it, it's interesting. Again, I, I'd like to come back to, um, you know, the, the, the challenge between um, responding to homelessness and preventing homelessness that uh, Gentry raised. And just, I'll, I'll give an example in the project that, uh, project that I did with my colleague, uh, uh, Rebecca Russell Bennett, which was around older women. One of the big challenges was that women didn't see themselves as homeless, so they didn't go to shelters. The second challenge was often they'd lived quite typical lives. They'd had, and as somebody put in the Q&A, you know, um, a health crisis, a, a relationship breakdown, a, a loss of job or some thing that was a tipping point, but they had some resources. And if they did think that they needed some housing support, when they went to a specialist housing service, they were turned away because they still had resources. So essentially the women were sent away until they depleted all their resources and they were actually fully in crisis. So this is a challenge that arises because of funding models that we have and who people can respond to and how they can respond to it. Um, our response to that, and this was working with Mission Australia, we worked with Suncorp uh, Bank, we worked, worked with Moreton Bay Regional Council, was what if we could stop that? Like, what if we could prevent that happening, prevent the woman getting to the point where uh, um, she had to deplete all her, her services? And so we co-designed um, sort of a help hub that was based around well-being and different scenarios women might have. And it was about, we looked at the um, literature, we identified what were the types of tipping, point, tipping points, we developed sort of personas, and then it was a, a matter of uh, women doing a bit of a quiz, and they could be guided through a strength-based approach. It wasn't what they didn't have, but what they did have to... Um, different resources, whether they needed, you know, social support or emotional support, psychological support or um, financial support through through banks. And one of the benefits of this, and this was working with Suncorp, is that they could see when a woman was changing um, her, uh, you know, changing her details, insurance details, her uh, residential address or something like that, and that would send a prompt saying you've got some some change going on here are some sites that might help you make some decisions and we were able to develop a strength-based approach that uh, exposed women to resources uh, that were able to support them in ways that they could have access to, to um, information to support their decision making so they didn't have to go to the specialist housing service so this is a different way that uh, that data was used and brought together in a way that could uh, provide prevention. So it is that the, the tension between those people who are already there and how do you stop people from getting uh, to that point because the costs are like 25 billion a year in Australia. So it's really important to be thinking about that. Yeah, thank you. That's um, that's really interesting. Really interesting to hear that um, that sort of you know innovative and important um, prevention strategy and uh, ways that we might think about doing that. And uh, and uh, yeah, so that's a huge number in there that you used. Um, Deborah, I'm going to ask you. Uh, you know, so you you made some really valuable points in your in your um, presentation, but um. And, and um, you're also sort of a member of the university student community. And, and I'm guessing that um, in terms of like young people and particularly students, uh, they can be a, a sort of an example of a very vulnerable group in our society. We've heard about, uh, you know, women and older people and, and uh, even our First Nations people. But I think students also fall into this sort of vulnerable category. Would you like to talk a little bit about homelessness and, and how it's addressed or how it's um, sort of faced in, in your circle? Yeah, thank you very much, Kerry. So um, Australia has emerged as the third largest destination for students to 
to come to study, you know, after the United Kingdom and the USA. And with this, you know, increasing number of visas being issued, it is expected that the, the student accommodation market in Australia would be facing a housing crisis, which is already happening. And uh, because there are fewer supplies of birds and uh, affordable um, accommodations across Australia. And as um, Gentry rightly um, stated that homelessness does not necessarily mean that they're sleeping on the streets. It could mean that um, they're living in a crowded place, a dwelling that is not adequate enough, you know, that does not support a good mental health state and and things like this, and as you would expect, the student needs um, an environment, you know, where they are relaxed, that is conducive for learning. Students or youths, everybody in general, actually, but then, you know, thinking about youths and students. So I think um, some of the things that needs to be addressed are the adequacy of dwelling, you know, and um, the the ability to, to actually get those rental um, properties in the first place, which I'll call rental experience. So coming from a, when I came in as a student, you imagine coming maybe from your parents' house from another country to a foreign country where you know nobody, probably you've never even rented a house. And then before you rent a place, you're asked to, to present um, some, you know, to have been in a rental house, maybe for six months, you need to get a letter of reference and stuff like that. And this is you in a foreign country, you know nobody, you've never had that experience before. So it makes it hard to even get a rental place that is already very limited, that is already in high demand. Also, another thing I think is rental affordability um, affects this kind of things because already the cost of education, cost of living in general in Australia is already high. So um, there needs to be more um, affordable housing you know, for students, for young people, um, and, and maybe even for people with low income. I think investors need to do more, the government needs to do more um, with addressing um, those kind of things. Also putting into the fact that Australia's population is also growing. I know we know a lot of it is aging, but it's also growing with immigration in and, and, and younger people increasing. So yeah, I think um, those are some of the things that needs to um, be looked into. Also income inequality, you know, needs to be addressed amongst young people and, 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 and students that are coming in. Yeah, so I think this, this could be done. And again, like I said, the rental experience should be made more um, student friendly. There are so many things they can, they can't. So some things happened in the uh, in rental um, community recently that when houses are advertised to be say $450 per week, some people would go behind and offer them $480 per week and they would get the money. Students are not able to do this kind of thing. So. So price gorging and 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 ordering, all of these things need to be critically looked into and addressed to prevent homelessness or living in very poor conditions for students and for young people. Okay, thank you, Deborah. That's um, that's very insightful, very helpful. Um, I'm going to turn to some of the Q and A questions. Thank you very much, people who um, put these in. Um, and we'll we'll turn first. I'm sure you can see them as well. But um, Natalie, you're already answering, uh, typing an answer to the, the first question, but maybe you'd like to talk to it. To what extent does data um, suggest a causal relationship between relationship breakdown and homelessness? And are there other factors that might play a more significant role? Yes, what I was going to type in is what we have seen in the last year is of the people who we have surveyed, we do have a common survey tool right now, it's the VI SPADAT, but we are going to launch a more Australian version of a tool, which will be called the Ovid, like long names. Um, with the tool, we do look in, we do ask a number of questions, which looks at previous tenancy histories, if they're experiencing any chronic health, mental health, substance use histories, as well as relationship breakdown and safety concerns. And more than half of the people we do we have surveyed in the last year have expressed that a relationship breakdown is the cause of the current experience of homelessness. Not to say that's the only reason that they are now in homelessness, but it is something that has driven the current episode that they were experiencing. But mental health, poorly managed mental health, does come up quite a lot with people who have been experiencing long-term homelessness, as well as unmanaged health. And of course, the lack of having the income available to them to even afford a private rental in the current market just aggravates the entire situation. Um, and leading into what the second question was, this does cause a long term effect on people who are experiencing homelessness, because if you aren't able to get into a house into the housing market, it does start to aggravate other factors. So it does start to 
you do start to see mental health declining. You do see people start to prioritize looking for a home over managing their own chronic health issues and linking in the primary care. You do start to see people turning to substance use where they just want to be able to dull whatever is going on because it's easier than trying to go through the pain of what's happening to them right now. And you do start to feel like you're just stuck in this cycle. And somebody who's been homeless for a long time is going to need help once they get housed to learn how do you hold on to your key? How do you look after your own tenancy? How do you look after your property? And how do you be a good neighbor in that process? So people who have been homeless for a very long time, anywhere between longer than, I think we usually see longer than one to five years of homelessness are going to need some supports once they get housed to learn how to be a tenant again. And that's something that we are advocating for is that supportive housing to be able to support people once they get housed. Um, and that does then cause that cycle. So if you don't get that support once you get housed, you start to break down in your tenancy and you end up back out on the street or back in a temporary accommodation seeking support again. And that becomes a cycle for somebody who doesn't get the help they need right away. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's um, that's very important and something that we often um, sort of don't get to that part of thinking about. So thank you. Um, would anybody else like to respond to the, the second question here, the long-term effects of homelessness on individuals? And are there, in particular, is there any data available to investigate the duration of individuals' experiences with homelessness? Well, I, I can say that's definitely not something that's going to be captured by ABS data collection, census data collection. Um, so that's something that's going to have to be captured elsewhere. Um, okay, right. Melissa, in the report that you uh, you wrote recently, uh, was this a, a topic of conversation there, or topic? your report you're on mute yes <laughs> uh, there's quite a significant literature uh, that um, talks about the relationship between just these types of things uh, but often what you find is it's it's complex that they overlay, lay each other, overlay each other and that you know um, people becoming homeless, ho ho experiencing homelessness or housing stress can exacerbate health problems. They skip medication. They, you know, doing a bunch of other things to try and solve that housing crisis that they're experiencing. And that sends other aspects of their life into crisis. And I think this is what Natalie was talking about. But there's quite a, a strong literature that talks about the relationship between these factors. So, uh, and um, that was why in our project, um, what we were looking at were how could we identify these uh, tipping points? How could we uh, take a strengths-based approach to them? Like how could we assist people to maintain their physical, emotional, mental well-being while they were trying to solve these other as, other problems that they're having while they were trying to uh, resolve their housing stress or to stay in appropriate accommodation. Um, and that was, uh, we co-designed our project with women who had experienced homelessness with expert proxies, so people who were from specialist housing services, and they talked about these, uh, how these different aspects are conflated and feed off each other. And it's about how do you um, manage those in a way that can be tailored to uh, an individual person's particular need at a particular time. Because I think as it's come up, it's not, it, you know, for some people it might be quite a long period or alternatively people can slip in and out of this. So their needs will be different at different times and we need tailored solutions. Okay, thank you. Um, that's that's really helpful, and I think that that uh, sort of leads into the the uh, you know the message that I'm getting, which is that there are you know, there is an opportunity for um, organisations like you know university and research groups and the, the sort of the academic literature, if you like, and and also the um, the people who are working on, at, at the coalface, like uh, like Natalie's team and others working to. Uh, to obtain this information and then other agencies who are really, you know, trying to provide the, the services and the support for people experiencing homelessness. 
to come together to really try to address this issue. And I can see that from this discussion, there's been quite a lot of uh, ways in which data and data science and data analysis can really play a role in, um, in supporting the, the, the insights that we, we um, obtain, understanding the, 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 the structure and the, the scope of the, uh, the issue and then um, providing some support for really um, impactful um, outcomes as, um, as Natalie and Melissa and Deborah and Gentry have discussed. So I'd like to thank all the panel members very much for, um, for their contributions. I'm going to ask you quickly, we're going to just go around in 10 words, can you think about like a message that you would like to give to people? What's the, what's the message that you would like to give in 10 words? Now, none, nobody's heard this before. So if you want to, to just pass, then that's fine. But uh, what is it that you would like to say? And while you're thinking about that, I'll just wrap by saying that um, this, uh, this webinar has been brought to, to, to us by the Centre for Data Science. So thank you to the, uh, the um, Becky uh, and Tim in the Centre for Data Science, and also by the Queensland Academy of the Arts and Sciences. This is a joint exercise with the Academy. Both Melissa and myself are members of the Academy and, um, and uh, proud to have that connection with the Academy. So um, because of that, Melissa, would you like to, have, what's your 10 words? Uh, homelessness can affect anyone and it's everybody's responsibility to find a solution. Perfect, thank you. Deborah. Thank you. Um, I would just like to say that um, homelessness affects everyone, as you rightly said, but uh, young people are the future of tomorrow. If we don't let them have um, a good base right now, it's gonna be hard for them to become useful people tomorrow. So let us attack homelessness now in young people. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Natalie. I'm gonna say homelessness is solvable. That's our motto, that's what we're gonna go for. And we can make that happen if we just keep collecting the data and working together. Perfect, thank you. Gentry. I guess I'd say uh, cooperation is really gonna be the key. Um, sharing data, working with others, that's 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 what we need to do. Thank you. Well, thank you to all the, the presenters, panel members. It's been very, very interesting discussion. Thank you to the, the audience and the participants. And, and um, with that, thank you very much. And we'll close the session.